Hello, and welcome to the Argyle CISO Leadership Forum. My name is Vicki Lynn Brunskill with Argyle. It's great to have everyone joining us today. I have some important information to share with you, and then we'll turn the floor over to our esteemed opening keynote speaker. First, we'd like to take a moment to thank today's sponsors, Lookout and Hawks Hunt. Our sponsors are committed to providing you with, a, with valuable content and a great overall experience today. At any time during today's event, you can visit their virtual booths from the main agenda page, which include complimentary materials and information. We also welcome you to stay socially connected during today's event. For those of you who are active tweeters, please use the hashtag Argyle Digital and follow us on Twitter at Argyle Exec Forum. Also, be sure to follow Argyle on LinkedIn for special announcements. And I'd like to just take a moment to touch on our content neutrality policy, which we've curated based on the feedback we've received over the years from our members. We've worked closely with our speaking faculty today for today's event to ensure that you receive a set of balanced and neutral viewpoints during the sessions, and we appreciate our members' support of this policy. And finally, and most importantly, we want to hear from you today. So during each session, we encourage you to submit your questions and comments in the Q&A box on your screen, and following each presentation, we've set aside time for our speakers to weigh in on those questions. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. Now let's get started. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Special Agent Lisa Marie Kerr, Private Sector Coordinator at the Federal Bureau of Investigation. We are very excited to have Lisa with us for her opening keynote presentation titled Ransomware Readiness, Response, and Remediation. Welcome, Lisa. Over to you. Well, good morning. Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, as Vicki said, I'm Lisa Kerr with the FBI in the Tampa Division. I'm currently the private sector coordinator. Um, I started with the FBI actually in 1988, 34 years ago. And my first assignment was Washington, D.C., where I worked on background investigations. And, um, and I was also assigned to legal counsel division. I'm a licensed Florida attorney. Um, and, but I worked on a special DNA task force back when DNA evidence was new and, and cutting edge. Um, I worked with prosecutors to help that uh, gain general acceptance and the legal community. After that, I went to Philly for a short period of time, back to Washington, D.C., and then here to Tampa, where I worked um, white collar crime and uh, various other matters. Um, I'm often asked what made me want to become an FBI agent and grow. I'm from Philly originally. So growing up in the 70s and 80s in Philly, organized crime with La Cosa Nostra was a huge problem, always in the newspaper, lots of crime violence, lots of mob hits uh, in Philly. And who was always there, but the FBI was always on scene in the newspaper and on the news. And I thought that would be an incredible career if I could just do that. Um, and I was lucky enough to get back to Philly during my career and actually work with some of those agents who made those big cases who at the time they were getting ready to retire, but I did get back there just in the nick of time to be a helper on some, some of those types of cases, which was really exciting. But back in 1988, when I started with the FBI, cyber was not a problem. We really didn't have a lot of, you know, using computers. It has grown enormously since I've been an FBI agent. Um, and we do see organized groups, not necessarily LCN, but organized groups who are involved in all kinds of cyber attacks um, and cyber schemes. Um, I frequently discuss, have presentations related to cyber fraud, uh, business email compromise. But today we're going to talk about a very important topic, which is ransomware. And one of the key things that a company should strive to is to be cyber resiliency. That's, that's a, a, an important topic that I want to discuss right from the beginning. And what we really mean by that is that a company can defend against cyber attacks, have an adequate cyber security risk management plan, and then guarantee business continuity both during a cyber attack and after the, the incident is over. So uh, some of the key points I wanna stress on today are to help, help your organizations become more cyber resilient. So we're gonna talk very briefly about crime statistics. I promise I won't bore you with a lot of statistics. Um, talk about some cases. I love to bring in cases with my presentations because I think it's a lot more interesting to hear about some cases uh, rather than just speaking in generic terms. But more, most importantly is to give you some checklists, give you a playbook for what you should do um, if you potentially are uh, the victim of a ransomware attack. Now, as you all know, ransomware is a type of malicious software or malware that encrypts data on a computer, making it unusable. And then malicious cyber criminals hold that data hostage until a ransom is paid. 
And what my agency does, we have an internet crime complaint center where we receive cyber complaints um, over the course of a year. And then every year my agency puts out a bulletin for the prior year. So in analyzing the bulletin from cybercrime 2022, if you look on the screen, you will see, we see 2,385 complaints. Now that's just complaints to my agency. Um, it's not nationwide, all agencies, but to my agency, which is a small number of complaints. We know that it's much more than that. And in fact, in our belief is that only 20% of victims of ransomware attacks are actually reporting them. And there can be a lot of reasons to for not reporting. We understand that. Um, sometimes companies are embarrassed. Sometimes companies fear that it could affect stock prices. It could affect shareholders. But one of the things we want to emphasize throughout this presentation is the importance of reporting a ransomware attack, whether you pay the ransomware or not, not uh, because we would want to investigate and we want to follow who's doing this. As you can see from this slide, these are the different, different infrastructure sectors which are victimized by ransomware. And you can see the defense industrial base is very few. And then as you go down the slide, it grows um, greater and greater. Uh, the defense industrial base is probably few for a lot of reasons, one being that their encryption of their computer networks are such, it's very difficult to, to uh, make an attack on any kind of defense industrial base. So as you can see, as we go down further, these other industries are, are not so lucky, um, including healthcare and public health, which is um, one of the worst places where a ransomware attack could occur because lives can be impacted. So the, the first case I wanted to talk about, or the first type of ransomware is the Hive, Hive ransomware. Um, and this was a case you may have read about it in the newspaper. It was actually out of this division of the FBI where we had some very good luck. Um, and this whole um, case came about because one victim complained to us. Uh, and we know that there were a lot more victims who were, um, who were being impacted by this Hive ransomware. Um, and what Hive is, is a sophisticated form of ransomware as a service model featuring developers who developed the ransomware and affiliates who, um, who uh, are identify who should be attacked. They, they look for the, the victims who would be the high value targets, and then they actually unleash the ransomware on those, tar on those victims. So one thing, a couple of things that's important to know about this, this Hive network is some of the things, we learned a lot of important things from this case, and I, I wanna share that with you so you can learn from uh, what happened in this matter, is that the, the criminals would access the network and they would be in there for a very long period of time. Could be days, could be weeks. And while they're in there, they're elevating privileges within the network and spreading ransomware from, from computer to computer, from workstation from workstation. And the other thing that we noticed is that they engaged in what we consider to be double extortion, which means they would encrypt the data and seek a ransom for the encrypted data but they would also exfiltrate and steal the information. And then they would seek a second uh, payment in order not to share their information or not to publish the, the company's private information. So it was really double extortion in our, in our belief. And that's why we really counsel companies not to pay ransomware demands. Besides impacting and, and encouraging um, further ransomware attacks, uh, it's also these people really their words, not their bond. So they may say they're going to, you know, release your data back to you. And then they come at you seeking more money not to publish your data. So we always uh, say not to pay them. We understand, however, that it's a business decision um, and that companies sometimes feel the need to pay. But we always ask that, that we be notified as to what happened so we can conduct an investigation. Now, in this case, a company did tell us uh, that they were had been the victim of this ransomware attack, and we were able to covertly infiltrate the Hive network so that we were actually in there so we could see that they were going after many more victims and who were not reporting it to our agency. Uh, and we were able to basically hack the hacker and come up with our own decryption key, and we were able to provide the decryptor to um, 300 Hive victims therefore saving victims $130 million in ransomware payments. And what we found is that um, there's a number of ways that these ransomware attackers can get into to, uh, the network, from phishing, 
uh, from uh, drive-by malware attacks. Uh, but the number one attack factor we find is VTP and or, I'm sorry, RDP and VPM with single factor authentication. Um, so what our cyber experts in preparing for this presentation today, the first thing they wanted me to say is that basically cyber 101 is really important to start at the basic levels because uh, if you just have a very strong network and you're prepared, you can do a lot to, to protect, to prevent a ransomware attack from occurring. And just a couple of the very basic things to start out with is having complex password requirements, required password changes, required network account audits, uh, managing security patches and updating software. And of course, multi-factor authentication. While, while it is a big pain in the neck, um, that is the one thing that we see across the board with not just ransomware attacks, but with business email compromise and other cyber attacks, multi-factor authentication uh, we find is key to protecting yourself. But you can't forget about the employees and the vendors that you're dealing with. Um, training of employees and vendors are uh, is key um, for, and it's on best cybersecurity practices and on phishing tests. Here in the FBI, we do phishing tests at least twice a month. Our, our um, security folks do a phishing test on all of us, FBI agents such as myself and all FBI employees. Um, that's how important my agency thinks it is to prevent um, any kind of cyber attack. And as far as vendors go, just, I don't know if uh, you like Target. Target happens to be one of my favorite stores. And unfortunately they have a big Target as their symbol. Um, and as you may recall that in December of 2013, Target was the victim of a malware attack. And what you may not realize is that that really wasn't, the initial attack was not Target's fault. Um, they came at Target through a vendor, through an HVAC um, employee. And it was through one phishing email of an HVAC company. So Target had hired the HVAC company and had given them access for billing purposes to their network. So once the bad actor was in the HVAC's network, they were able to get into Target through that, that portal. Um, and that was through one employee of the HVAC company clicking on a phishing email. So the training of employees and vendors is very important. A lot of times companies may forget about vendors, but they're key. Uh, and just think of the whole target situation. And one thing that um, while the initial attack may not have been um, Target's fault, uh, what happened after the, the, the criminals were in their network was Target's fault because what they didn't do, they did not segment their network. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about networks. First of all, it's really key to develop and update a comprehensive network diagram that describes the systems and the data flow. And the reason this is important is if something were to happen, it helps incident responders understand and where to focus their effort, efforts on a network activity. And having you know audits, as I referenced in the prior um, the prior slide, is that they let you distinguish between normal, legitimate activity and perhaps nefarious network activity. Um, as far as oh, getting back to the phishing tests. Uh, what happens in the FBI if one of us fails a phishing test? Well, the initial thing that happens is uh, security will reach out to us and let us know that, that we failed the, the phishing tests. And what could happen next with that is if you fail too many phishing tests, then you could be required to take uh, additional training, uh, additional uh, cybersecurity type training. Um, as far as the network, um, it's really key to prevent the lateral movement of ransomware or malware for that fact uh, by having network segmentation, by controlling traffic flows between and access to the various subnetworks. So going back to the target example, um, target's network was not segmented. So what that meant is when those, those bad actors who entered through the HVAC link um, were in Target's network, they were able to get through customer data and get to the credit card information. And that was about um, 110 million people who were impacted, customers who were impacted by that. So as far as the, the I wanna give you some quick checklist that you can just refer back to. Top priority is backing up all critical information, making sure backups are regularly tested, 
storing your backups separately, maintaining gold images of critical systems in the event they need to be rebuilt, um, retaining backup hardware to build systems, and encrypting sensitive data or storing it on air gap station or an air gap system. That is the key thing. If you take nothing else away from this presentation, take back backing up all critical information. Um, have a plan who will be assisting in mitigation and remediation. Conduct tabletop exercises, include, and you're going to need to include your CEO and top executives. Just very briefly, I could talk about Colonial Pipeline, the whole ransomware attack on them for an hour, but just very briefly with Colonial Pipeline, uh, the reason that they're important is because um, in May of 2021, Colonial P Pipeline received a ransomware attack. It hit the IT system. Within 15 minutes, Colonial Pipeline had shut down the operational technology section as well. Now, what this meant is 5,500 miles of pipeline was shut down as a result of this. They, they were able to leap into action very quickly because they had a plan. Their CEO had a plan. He had participated in these tabletop exercises. Um, so his, his employees knew what to do when a ransomware attack occurred. And within 15 minutes, they had protected the pipeline. So it didn't go in into the operational technology part of the business. Um, that, that CEO um, had already authorized his lower level employees to make decisions to pay a ransomware or not. And they did pay it in this case. Uh, they thought it was best um, for their purposes and they're a key part of critical infrastructure in the United States. Um, we were able to successfully get back some of that money. It was paid in Bitcoin and we were able to locate it and seize back a good portion of it. And that um, executive, if you're ever interested in his testimony, it's Joseph Blount, and he testified before um, the Senate committee on what happened. And very interesting as far as the preparation that he did with his company. Access, assess your vulnerabilities. As I said, the number one attack vector is RTP and VPN with single factor authentication. Apply the principle of least privilege to all systems. Uh, block inbound connections from Tor. Tor is a way that criminals can communicate anonymously on the net. As far as if you are the victim of a ransomware attack, implement your security, incident response, and business continuity plan. That's why it's so important to have this plan, because if you have the plan, once this, at this attack occurs, uh, you can respond, you, you just go forward with your plan. There's no need to scramble at that point. Um, ensure that your backup data is offline if you've been attacked and secure. Scan it with an antivirus program. Now, this is key here. Halt the lateral movement in the network by taking the network completely offline by physically unplugging all network cables from the machines with network connect connections. Or if, you're, if you have a Wi-Fi network, unplug the network cables connecting the modem and or the routers. Sometimes uh, in the past, I've seen um, individuals or, or companies where they just turn the computers off, but turning the computer off does not get the ransomware attacker out of your network. When you turn it back on, the person is still there. That's why it's key to halt the lateral movement by take, taking it off, by physically unplugging all network cables. Um, triage impacted systems for restoration and recovery. Rebuild the system based on a prioritization of critical services using pre-configured standard images if possible. Uh, we also say do not attempt to, to change file extensions or to modify the encrypted files, because what that will do is when you go back in with a, uh, the, the, the decryptor, it's going to impact whether you can access those files again. Um, change all online account passwords and network passwords after removing the system from the network, which is also key, and then changing the actual system passwords, passwords once the malware is recovered from the system. Now, as I indicated, we don't recommend paying the ransom, um, and we do uh, recommend contacting federal law enforcement regarding possible decryptors available, both both the FBI and also CISA, which is an incredible organization, we're both constantly doing work on, on thwarting ransomware attackers. And we may actually have, um, you know, that we may actually have a decryptor that's available for a company. That's why it's so important to reach out to federal law enforcement. 
uh, regarding these possible decryptors. And we will never interfere in your decision to, if you want to pay a ransomware, we will never thwart that or do anything to interfere with your business decision to do that. Um, our goal is to be helpful. And to, if we have a decryptor available, that would be fantastic. Um, as far as if there's ever a scenario where you should pay, we really, we really just don't recommend doing that um, because we really can't trust these actors, whether they're actually going to do what they say they do, because I mean, let's face it, these people, you know, they are criminals, so um, they're really not somebody you would want to trust. Uh, but we do understand that sometimes, you know, we do understand that it's a business decision and uh, because with the ransomware attack, the network could be tied up for a very long time. Um, that's why we kind of really stress more preparation. Try to prevent a ransomware attack and make yourselves less vulnerable. Um, so you're really not in a position of, you know, whether you have to pay a ransomware attack, if you can prevent it from happening. Of course, that's the most important thing. And that's kind of where the private sector coordinator position has come from. It's kind of a new position that I'm in where I go out and I do presentations and I, um, you know, I let companies know where their vulnerabilities are. So perhaps if they, they can be better informed, they'll do a, a better job of preventing a ransomware attack from occurring. And here are some key things that please try, remember this address. Um, you can file a report with the FBI at www.ic3.gov. And where that goes to is where there's a whole group full of analysts and every report filed there, I promise you, will get reviewed by an analyst, no matter what it is, even if it isn't ransomware, www.ic3.gov. And also uh, we encourage filing a report with CISA at www.cisa.gov backslash forms, backslash report. Um, CISA, uh, if you're not familiar with that agency, are full of analysts who, um, they, they review reports of cyber crimes and they put out incredible bulletins, um, warning people about different cyber crimes, ransomware, business email compromise, the whole gamut of, of cyber offenses. So CISA is a fantastic organization. If you're not on their website, I, I encourage you to go to CISA.gov and, and check it out and ask to be put on the list for uh, bulletins. And my um, agency as well, the IC3.gov, also has uh, all kinds of bulletins that we post every day, uh, warning about different attacks. So if you, um, if you file a report with the FBI, it'll go to an analyst who will immediately take a look at it. They'll immediately triage it, particularly for ransomware. They will reach out immediately to the field office where you're located and let an agent or supervisor know that this is occurring. And then an agent will reach out from one of the field offices where you're located and you don't have to remember all this. I just wanted to give you a flavor for the kind of things that are very helpful to my agency when we follow up on a ransomware attack. Um, we look for images of infected um, systems, malware samples, uh, live random access memory capture, uh, recovered executable files. This is very important. IP addresses identified as malicious or suspicious. As we keep track of those, we put out reports so does CISA about these IP addresses and that way companies can know what to look for and, and um, how to prevent one of these addresses attacking their network. Um, the email addresses of the attacker, a copy of the ransom note, the ransom amount, uh, Bitcoin wallets used by the attackers because what we're finding is um, Bitcoin is the number one um, a method of payment that these uh, cyber actors are looking for. Uh, the Bitcoin wallets, if the company paid your Bitcoin wallet, and any kind of post-incident forensic reports. Those are all very helpful. That would be helpful when an agent does reach out to your company if you have been the victim of a, a ransomware attack. And in conclusion, uh, some follow-up actions is to conduct a post-incident review of your response, assess the strengths and weaknesses of your incident response plan, and document the lessons learned to go ahead and refine your organization policies, plans, and procedures. Because in, in uh, preventing a ransomware attack, it's imperative that you come up with your own plan that's specific to your company so you can have the, the strongest defense possible. And once again, here is our Internet Crime Complaint Center. 
Um, that's our address, www.ic3.gov. Um, so please don't hesitate to file any kind of cyber uh, concern that you have. Now, looking at the questions, um, I can see um, what are the most overlooked steps or items that organizations leave out of their playbooks when attempting to thwart ransomware before an attack? I think one of the number one things is they forget uh, like to train or to offer training to the vendors for the company. Uh, the vendors some can, sometimes can be the weakest link. Um, and also employees, a lot comes down to employees how good are those, those individuals with uh, cybersecurity? You could have the best cybersecurity in the world. And if those employees aren't careful and aren't you know, doing their job related to cyber uh, hygiene, they can leave a company really vulnerable. And one of the things that we learned, we learned so much from the target malware attack. That's another attack that I could spend an hour talking about. But one of the things that we learned is that you know, cyber spent, our target sent millions of dollars upgrading their whole cyber security plan. And they actually had hired a company that was um, to report to them any kind of nefarious activity. And that, that entity did report to them, but it was left, um, for whatever reason, this was during Christmas season, for whatever reason, the uh, employees in the security department did not catch that, that warning. They got a second warning that data was being exfiltrated. And again, that was left unheeded. So the, the importance of training your employees can't be overstated. And how do you gauge cyber resiliency effectiveness when you have dependency to third parties? Um, that's why it's important to, to train those third parties and include them. And if your company is doing cyber training, include your third party vendors in that training in order to make sure that their network is secure and then your network is secure as well. Well, thank you, everyone. I, I've enjoyed being here today. Um, and um, I, I wish you good luck with the conference and, um, and have a wonderful day. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you for that insightful and practical um, presentation. It's nice that you included all of that information for uh, reports and, and uh, resources. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining this, us for this session. And this session, along with all of today's content, will be available on demand following the event. Thank you again, Lisa. Thank you. Have a good day.